Well, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Manish Srivastava. Manish uh, got his PhD degree at Carnegie Mellon University in 2007. And for more than a decade now, he's been a, a scientist at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, uh, DOE lab in Washington state, where he's now a senior staff scientist and a project manager. And uh, Manish has, uh, uh, is a recipient of the DOE Early Career Award. And uh, through that, he's been exploring uh, aerosols and their impacts on, on the Earth system and including the work that he'll be uh, talking about today, which uh, comes from uh, uh, DOE and uh, other investigators uh, work down in the Amazon. And as soon as we have the, this Zoom system, so this is our ESS is getting into the hybrid thing here. So we have, uh, typically we've had about as many uh, online as, as here in the room. Um, so we'll try to serve that part of the audience too, but not that you guys are important. Okay, thanks. Alex. And so take it away, Manish. Thanks, Alex, for this nice introduction. And thank you all for coming to the seminar. It's always a privilege uh, coming to you here and meeting such an esteemed group of colleagues and students. Um, so the work which I'm going to present today is uh, about uh, an integrated model measurement study, which we did over a couple of years now. Uh, and the goal of this study was uh, understanding SOA formation. And in this case, I am focusing on isoprene epoxy dial SOA. So over the Amazon region, isoprene, as we know, is one of the most abundant VOCs emitted, and it has a lot of role to play in atmospheric chemistry and SOA formation. So I want to, uh, this was just published recently, uh, and I want to uh, acknowledge all my co-authors, including Alex here. Um, I also want to acknowledge the US Department of Energy's Office of Science, Biological and Environmental Research, Early Career Award, uh, and ASR for funding. Okay. So this is just a very general slide um, about, you know, why do we want to study secondary organic aerosols and what are they? So mostly we know like uh, the way we distinguish, we have primary organic aerosols, which are directly emitted from various sources. It could be vehicles, it could be uh, power plants, um, you know, so these are directly emitted organic uh, species in the particle phase. And the way SOA or secondary organic aerosol is different is because it starts its lifetime in the gas phase. So you have a various kind of volatile organic compounds, isoprene, terpenes, and also many other VOCs emitted from anthropogenic sources. Um, and these react in the atmosphere um, and, and make thousands of oxidation products. Some of them can condense directly on particles, the others undergo multi-phase chemistry. So the reaction between gas phase VOCs and particle phase components. Um, for example, in this case, I am talking about IEPOX SOA, which is one, one um, example of multi-phase chemistry. It needs chemistry both in the gas phase and particle phase to form this species. Um, when we think about other species like sulfate and black carbon, like most of the climate modelers, um, think about them, they are mostly one species, like you could think of sulfate as one species, black carbon as one species, but SOA, even if, if we refer to it as one species, it's not one species because each 
particle of SOA is made of thousands of organic compounds and and these uh, the composition of these particles can change dynamically in the atmosphere and the reason SOA is, is really important is um, you know you you may have very small clusters of nuclei which are found maybe it's sulfate or some uh, highly oxidized organic molecules but to facilitate the growth of these clusters to sizes which are relevant for clouds and cloud condensation nuclei sizes uh, organics and SOA plays a central role and so in this way they affect radiation and clouds and they are uh, really important to the atmosphere. Okay, um, so this is just another chart from the IPCC radiative forcing. Um, and so on the top, you have all the greenhouse gases, and then you know they are warming uh, some of, and then you have um, in the in the central portion you have things like uh, black carbon and organic aerosols. But the main point here is that the primary the organic carbon which was uh, which was included in the IPCC radiative forcing bar chart, it's mostly primary. And SOA was not even included in the radiative forcing estimates uh, because the report, the previous IPCC report acknowledged that uh, th there is tremendous complexity and uncertainty in the processes involved in SOA formation. So even though the radiative forcing bar chart talks about organic carbon, it's primary, it's not the secondary component of organic aerosol. And, and so I would expect like given that the SOA is ubiquitous along uh, in the globe, you would expect that the direct radiative forcing of SOA is at least similar or greater than the primary organic carbon. But even more importantly, the role of SOA in cloud forcing is more uncertain because uh, it can interact with CCN and clouds. There is also aqueous chemistry and cloud chemistry going on. And so the forcing of so the SOA cloud interactions are not well understood. That's one of the things about this, uh, which I wanted to mention. And this is just a figure from our reviews of geophysics paper that came out in 2017, um, where we are showing the one of the main um, points of this paper is that we cannot think of biogenic sources separate from anthropogenic sources, right? You have biogenic VOCs doing their own thing, making SOA and anthropogenic SOA being formed in its own respect, but in, in, in actuality, in the atmosphere, these interact together. And, and the interactions between anthropogenic and biogenic VOCs uh, is what, um, there are a variety of pathways. It could be through sulfate, NOx, but even interactions among organic molecules coming from uh, anthropogenic and biogenic sources. And these interactions are important because they affect the phase state of SOA, whether it's liquid, solid or semi-solid in the atmosphere. Uh, and that really affects how much more SOA can form. So, uh, because that affects the viscosity of these particles and also their volatility and lifetimes. So if you have a solid particle, for example, of SOA, um, you know, the diffusion uh, time scales within that would be very large. And so it would be harder to make more SOA on top of it um, in the conventional uh, volatility uh, frameworks. Um, whereas if you have a liquid-like particle, you know, it can easily absorb more organic mass and you make more SOA. Uh, and so that feeds, feeds back into new particle formation, growth and evaporation kinetics, but also the multi-phase chemistry, which is chemistry that happens both in gas and particle phases. And the reason it is important is, again, it affects CCN number, the optical properties, the climate-relevant properties of these particles, which interact with clouds and radiation and then feedback to biogenic VOC emissions. So you could see that the cycle is uh, complex and, and, and it's mainly the anthropogenic biogenic emissions, which are not well understood. And also they are not included in many of the regional and global models. And this could bias the radiative forcing of aerosols. Uh, so given this motivation in mind right now, I'm going to focus on one component of SOA, which has received a lot of attention in the past decade. Uh, and that, that's about isoprene epoxidiles. Um, and um, about a couple of decades ago, it was the thought that isoprene does not make much SOA. Um, you know, the, the previous chamber studies in the 80s were not making much SOA from isoprene itself. But then a decade ago, there were uh, these um, 
findings about isoprene epoxidiol SOA, which is made by multi-phase chemistry. So you have, you need gas phase chemistry like isoprene oxidizes. After two generations, you make IEPOX in the gas phase, but then you need certain ingredients in the particle phase to make IEPOX SOA because uh, once the IEPOX gas is taken up in the particle phase, there is an acid catalyzed ring opening and then followed by nucleophilic addition of sulfate and water. And that's what makes the SOA in the particle phase. So you have like both gas phase and particle phase chemistry being equally, I mean, being contributing to IEPOX SOA. And there are, if you look here, like this is from uh, the WHO et al. 2015 paper, the, uh, you know, there were several places, the pie charts are uh, in, the, in the green, the, that is the component of IEPOX SOA in the pie charts. And then the, uh, the shaded regions are just geoskin predictions of IEPOX gas. Um, so the, the key is that now it is well recognized that it is forming IEPOX SOA in many places, including over Amazon, over Southeast USA, it is shown to be really important, uh, the IEPOX SOA formation chemistry. But, but still, the point I want to make is that many models are still not treating the IEPOX SOA processes correctly. They are missing many, many key processes, including the viscosity of organic aerosols, which, which really, which is really important. Um, and so just, this is just a figure from our paper where it's, it's showing that, you know, you have, you have a core of inorganic aerosols at the center, which has sulfate, ammonium, water, it's acidic. It could be less acidic or more acidic. But then the, the reactive uptake of gas phase IPOX within this core depends on its diffusion, the mass accommodation coefficient within on the surface. But then also as the IPOX SOA starts forming, even if there is no other SOA around, as IPOX SOA starts forming around this core, it itself is highly viscous. So then it starts self-limiting further uh, uptake of IPOX SOA within the core. Uh, and then if you if you are in the real environment, you have many other species of SOA, you have monoterpene SOA, uh, sesquiterpene SOA, and all those, if they are forming a coating, um, then that will limit the uptake of IPOX. And then also one another key ingredient is that you need water in the particle phase in the core to make, um, you know, to for the aqueous chemistry to happen. So there are several process when, when as modelers, we try to model the IPOX SOA formation, need to think about several processes and their uncertainties. Diffusion limitations in the organic shell is one of them. There is chemical kinetics in the inorganic core that also needs to be well constrained by measurements. But then the getting the total organic aerosol concentrations right, what is the thickness of the coating? What is the viscosity of the coating material? That is really important. Uh, then obviously isoprene emissions are important because you know if you have depending upon how how well you are modeling the isoprene or getting the isoprene emissions right that could change the availability of gas phase IPOX. and then ultimately um, in addition to aqueous phase chemistry you have cloud phase chemistry uh, so you could think of you know the IPOX SOA forming um, becoming a CCN going into the cloud droplets, but then also there is an uptake of IPOX in the clouds. Uh, and even though the reaction kinetics are much slower in the clouds, the reaction volumes are large because you have large uh, water content in the clouds. So you will add some IPOX in the clouds. And then there is a, when the cloud droplet evaporates, you have the aerosol coming out and there is a cycling between cloud phase and particle phase here. Yeah. So these are complex processes which we need to think about when we when we think about modeling IPOX SOA formation. So this is uh, just to introduce the um, concept of viscosity here, uh, including you know Manabu was a co-author on one of these papers. Uh, but if you are going from uh, water all the way to uh, uh, olive oil, honey, all the way to marbles, you you are increasing the viscosity of that fluid. So since SOA can exist in a range of spectrum, it could be liquid near the surface, it could be solid in the upper troposphere. So that, so it, it goes through a range of these phase states. And uh, on the graph, which I'm showing, you have diffusion coefficient on the x-axis, you have particle diameter on the y-axis. And, and if you think in the semi-solid regime, if you have a one nanometer particle, maybe the diffusion time scales would be a minute or less. But if you have like a 100 or 200 nanometer particle, which has grown 
then the diffusion time scales can go up to a day or so. So in addition to viscosity, the size of the particle matters as it is growing. So that's one of the reason I'm showing this. The, the, then coming back to how we actually model IPOX SOA. So one, one way to model it is using core shell morphology. So in the core, you have inorganics, and then in the shell, you have the organics coating, coating it. Uh, and so the way you you, treat, you get the uptake, uh, the reactive uptake coefficient of IPOX gas by solving the spherical reaction and diffusion um, 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 equations here. And then, and then on top of that, you do a flux balance between uh, across different interfaces, across the organic air interface and the organic aqueous interface. And when you do this flux balance and solve the reaction and diffusion kinetic equations, uh, then you end up with a react overall reactive uptake coefficient, which has several terms on it, including gas phase diffusion, mass accommodation coefficient, but then also it's the reaction and diffusion occurring within the inorganic core, which has water inside it. So that is the aqueous uh, uh, term. And then you also have uh, the reaction and diffusion happening in the coating, the organic coating itself. So one of the things which is really important is we have to go back to actual measurements and try to see how well do we understand the kinetics of IPOX SOA formation. So this was another paper which came out from our group recently uh, where um, you know, we had single particle measurements uh, in a Teflon chamber in, at Emsel where we were, uh, you know, the, so this was led by Alas Alenyuk and, and co-authors like Jason Surat and Riva. Uh, so what they were doing is you had ammonium bisulfate seeds, which are put into a one meter cube Teflon chamber. And then on top of that, you inject IPOX gas. And then you are monitoring the changes in the size distribution of particles as you are forming IPOX SOA on these acidic seeds of ammonium bisulfate. Um, and uh, it was measured both by a DMA, but also the mini splat was measuring single particle composition density and also volatility change. And uh, this was done both at dry conditions and wet conditions. So I'm, I'm showing the dry condition experiment here. This is 5% RH. But since it is ammonium bisulfate, it does not efflorescence. So it, it, it always has some water content, even at 5% relative humidity, and it is highly acidic. So the pH is negative uh, 3.5 or so. Uh, but then once, once you start for, once you inject the epox gas and it starts forming um, uh, IPOX SOA, one component of that IPOX SOA is organosulfates. So once you make organosulfates, you are removing the inorganic sulfate from the particles and converting them to organosulfates. And what it does is it increases the acid, it decreases the acidity a lot. So if you look at the acidity plot here on the red line, uh, once you are forming the organosulfates, uh, you are converting the inorganic sulfate to organosulfate, the acidity is dropping by more than two pH units. Uh, whereas most many of the models, they do not treat the change in the acidity uh, or the conversion of inorganic sulfate to organosulfate. So they will keep it artificially at very high acidity. And so when we come when we compare box model simulations where uh, the blue curve, so, so if you look at the site distribution plots, this is after allowing the IPOX SOA to grow and form after two hours. So the black is measurements, the final measured size distribution there. Uh, and, and the blue line there is, is, the, is the models which do not account for organosulfate formation. So they keep the acidity high. So you could artificially make too much IPOX SOA. As you can see, the size distribution is shifted too much to the right. Whereas if you account for the uh, conversion of sulfate to organosulfate, you see much better agreement either by the red size distribution or the green, green lines there. Uh, and, and in addition to the constraints by size distribution, we can also compare the changes in the density of aerosol as, as you are forming IPOX SOA, you can look at volatility changes. So what the measurements were showing, the single particle measurements that about 90% of IPOX SOA was non-volatile. So that gives another constraint because uh, when, when you make IPOX SOA, you make two components. One of them is tetral component, which is due to water as nucleophile. And the other is organosulfate, which is which is of very low volatility. And tetras are semi-volatile, so some of them will partition back to the gas phase. But in the particles, some of them can also make oligomers, which is um, which is of low volatility. 
So, so the point here is that when you have multiple measurements of size, composition, density, volatility, and then also the mass spectral measurements, you can really use that to constrain um, what, what you know about the formation of IPOX SOA processes and the chemical kinetics. So that was just, uh, that was validation of some of the IPOX SOA mechanisms with laboratory studies. So this is now, I'm going back to trying to model the Amazon field campaign. Um, and so um, over during the Go Amazon 2014 field campaign, there were measurements by the DOE G1 aircraft, but also the German Hello aircraft was flying. And the German aircraft was flying all the way from near the surface uh, to about 12 to 14 kilometer altitude. Uh, and so this, this huge altitude range was a very nice constraint to understand the processes in the models. Um, so uh, the way I'm modeling it, WorkCam 4.2, again, like uh, uh, you can see the modeling domain over the Amazon here. Um, and, and the G1 aircraft had the PTRMS uh, instrument on board. So, so that gave a nice constraint about isoprene emissions. So initially when I started modeling it, WorkCam model was too high by a factor of three uh, with respect to isoprene emissions. So we had to bring it down because um, uh, I think it's really important to constrain the emissions also in addition to the um, mechanisms. And we have over the last few years, we have made several updates to SOA chemistry, new particle formation mechanisms, which we have published in different papers. And then also like building up with the box model evaluations, which I showed in the slide before that, before this, because we can, we need to evaluate our processes with actual controlled laboratory measurements to, to, to be certain that we are going in the right direction here. So the, the graph below that, that's just a plot of isoprene emission fluxes over the Amazon. Uh, and, and this is the, you know, the picture of the German Hello aircraft is shown, uh, but the key point here is that the vertical profile, uh, this shows the organic aerosol profile measured by the aerosol mass spectrometer over the Amazon. Uh, this is averaged across several flights during September uh, of 2014. So one, the, the key feature here is the observed organic aerosols are either peaking near the surface, like less than two kilometers or so, or there, there is another peak you could see above 10 kilometers in the upper troposphere. And in the middle troposphere, you see, um, you know, um, them dropping significantly. Uh, and so the main thing is we want to focus, we want to understand the what causes this bimodal peak. You have obviously near the surface, you have emissions and you, you have more chemistry going on. But then, then even in the upper troposphere, then what is causing the peak? in organic aerosols and IPOX SOA. Because um, in the upper troposphere, the temperatures are really low. It's 250 Kelvin, minus 50 degrees Celsius or so. So in, that means that at such low temperatures, whatever organic aerosol is existing, whether it's IPOX SOA or monotopene SOA, it is mostly in the solid phase. So I'm going to talk to you about that as well. So in WorkCam, we implemented a parameterization. Again, it's coming from Manabu's work, uh, where we can predict the viscosity and glass transition temperature of organic aerosols. So we are doing it online now because in WorkCam, we have several mechanisms which are making different kinds of SOA. There is biomass burning organic aerosols. There is uh, isoprene SOA. There is monotopene SOA, HOMS, new particle formation. You know, all these mechanisms we have developed and implemented in WorkCam. Uh, but then how does that, what is the overall viscosity of this organic mixture and how does that vary as a function of altitudes, as a function of temperature and relative humidity? So we found that, um, you know, near the surface over the Amazon, humidity is high, 70 to 80 percent, temperatures are warm. So the model is predicting that SOA is liquid-like. But if you look in the upper troposphere above like seven or eight kilometers, um, altitudes, then we, we are predicting SOA is mostly solid because of low rel relative humidity and very low um, temperatures in the upper troposphere. And one another finding from this work, uh, which also came out recently, is that if you take the log of viscosity and the logarithm of water, which is associated with organic aerosol, you get a very strong linear dependence. Um, and this is over the entire atmospheric column over the Amazon. So in, in field studies, if you don't have direct measurements of viscosity and you can estimate the water associated with organic aerosol based on its hygroscopicity and other things, 
then you can um, we think that you could figure out the viscosity to fairly good um, degree. Okay, so now going back to the uh, work camp simulations. So I started this work about a couple of years ago. Um, and here I'm showing on, on the leftmost, I'm showing three altitude ranges, like uh, because in the middle troposphere, the aerosol concentrations were very low. So we are only focusing on near surface and upper troposphere. And so if you look at zero to two kilometer, the y-axis is IPOS SOA mass concentration uh, averaged across a given flight. Um, and so between observed and default in blue, you get like factor of two or three difference. But if you, but if the, the main thing was, if you look in the upper troposphere, like 10 to 12 kilometer or 12 to 14 kilometer, there the model really struggled. So we could not make, I mean, the IPOX SOA, which the model predicted was 10 times lower than measurements. And that was a huge discrepancy. And there was very real reasons for that. Because if you look at the viscosity plot, like near surface, it is all liquid light. But at 12 kilometer altitude, the viscosity, the organic aerosol is solid. So if the aerosol is solid, there is no, I mean, you have very strong diffusion limitations. So IPOX will not be able to uh, go through the shell uh, of solid organic aerosol and then, uh, and then react with whatever is in the pore. That was one thing. And the other thing also is that uh, uh, because the relative humidity is low, we have like about 30% RH. So most of these salts, even uh, inorganic salts, they don't deliquesce at that uh, low relative humidity condition. So we were getting, like we were running the mosaic inorganic model here in WorthCam and that was predicting zero water in the particle phase. So if there is no aerosol liquid water, there is no way there can be aqueous chemistry. So that was a major conundrum when I was first started modeling this, I was like, okay, there is no way I'm getting IPOX SOA in the upper troposphere. There are, there are two main issues to it, this solid shell of organic aerosol and then also no liquid water. So then why is the aircraft actually, why is it seeing IPOX SOA in the upper troposphere? And that was a major conundrum for some time. So I'm going to like tell you a story about how you know this this thing evolved. Uh, so I was at the AMS meeting at some point, and then somebody was presenting uh, from some of measurements from Alex and Scott Martin's group, where there were this uh, possibility of direct measurements of methyl tetras. So now, if you if method if you condense methyl tetras, the AMS will measure them as IPOX SOA because they are one of the major components of IPOX SOA. So over the Amazon, like with the um, um, with the UAVs, uh, you know the, this paper is uh, showing that the two two methyl tetras are varying by more than 480 percent over hundreds of meters, and and the heterogeneity even even if the isoprene emissions are heterogeneous and their atmospheric oxidation happens, that does not explain these differences in two methyl tetras because they have a longer atmospheric lifetime here. So. Well, the direct emissions of two methyl tetral gases, which are modulated both by the type of forest and environmental stressors, was, was proposed to be the best explanation. This was a 2021 paper. So I was like, okay, this sounds like you know a great mechanism and maybe it can help because there is no other way I'm getting agreement. And so it was like connecting the dots between different me measurements and process level models. So when 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 you include the methyl tetra, so there, there is uncertainty in methyl tetral emissions, but the paper came out with some limits. So in, in my work, I use the lower bound of methyl tetral emissions uh, to include in WorfChem. And so if you add the methyl tetral emissions in the Wolf, in, in the WorfChem model, you still see like uh, compared to IPOX gas, near the surface methyl tetrals are 10 times lower in concentrations. And in the upper, even in the upper troposphere, methyl tetras are four times lower. So it's not like you are bombarding the model with too much methyl tetral gases. You know, it, it still sounds pretty reasonable because IPOX gas is, is much more abundant throughout the atmosphere. But, but the, major, um, the, the major thing to keep in mind is IPOX is highly volatile. Uh, it has three orders of magnitude higher volatility than two methyl tetras. Because two methyl tetras are semi-volatile, they can easily partition to the gas phase, both near the surface and, and the upper troposphere. So in the model, when you, when you include the, um, you know, the gas particle partitioning of methyl tetras, you see that near the surface at zero to two kilometer, the average fraction of methyl tetras 
partition to the particle phase is 60%. So 40% is in the gas phase. 60% of them are in the particle phase because temperatures are much warmer. But over the, over the high altitudes, what happens is that in Amazon, the deep convective events, um, you know, they are transferring these gases all the way to the upper troposphere. And where cloud detrainment occurs at 10 to 12 kilometers, it's really, it's very cold, like negative 50 degrees Celsius. And so at that cold temperatures, whatever methyl tetral gas was there, it will all condense to particle phase. So getting like 99.9% .9 in the particle phase in the upper troposphere. So they are very efficient in particle production just by direct condensation at, at those low temperatures. And, and the reality is that all the models which we know of, which I know of, none of them include these direct emission sources of methyl tetras. So that's this, it's a very important source. If the forest is emitting them by direct biological processes, uh, in this study, we found that their concentrations uh, in the upper troposphere, there are more than 90% of IPOX SOA, but even near the surface, their source is larger than atmospheric chemistry alone. But so far, like it is believed that uh, atmospheric chemistry is the major source of IPOX SOA. But when you include this and you constrain it by upper tropospheric measurements, right? Because if it was not for the upper troposphere, you could think that, oh, you don't know the kinetics well near the surface. You don't know the diffusion coefficient when near the surface. There are a lot of uncertainties if you're just looking at the surface. But when you really look in the upper troposphere where there is, there is major differences between the model and measurements, and you know pretty well there that diffusion limitations are real, the particles are solid, relative humidity is low. Um, and so in the only way you could explain it is with these direct emissions. So going back in, in WorkChem, we are uh, modeling the cloud. Uh, so this is a 10 kilometer grid spacing. It still doesn't get all the clouds, but it, there is a, uh, we had to run convective parameterizations. So WorkChem simulates cloud top heights either at 1.5 to 2 kilometers or deep convection that extends all the way to greater than 12 kilometer altitudes. So when you have deep convection events, you know the cloud where they entrain, that's, that's, all, that's at the upper troposphere between 10 to 14 kilometers. Another interesting finding from this work, which I'm not presenting here is, uh, you have a lot of new particle formation due to monoterpenes in the upper troposphere, you have like 50,000 particles per cc. But if you turn deep convection off, you will not be able to make those particles. So deep convection is actually coupling the surface to the upper troposphere. There is much less clouds in the middle troposphere. And then consistently, when you look at AMS organic aerosol measurements, you see two peaks, one near the surface and one at the upper um, at high, uh, at 10 to 12 kilometer altitudes. So this is some validation because the, um, the HALO aircraft, the German aircraft was also measuring things like temperature and relative humidity. So it's really important to get these things right in the models also. So if you look at some other global models, Sometimes they have like 70% relative humidity in the upper troposphere. Obviously that is not right, right? Because at least in this region, um, you know, the bars, um, the bars here are model and the dots which I'm showing are observations. So ambient temperature, um, both like for example, at 12 to 14 kilometer, you get 200 Kelvin and the model agrees with measurements. And then also for relative humidity, it's less than 40%, both in model and measurements. So it's, it's not going to 70% because of, of course, if you have 70 to 80% relative humidity, then you can have particle, then you can have liquid water in the particle phase. So, so it's important to, when you are modeling it, it's important to also um, um, evaluate the temperature and relative humidity profiles with aircraft measurements. And here WorfCam was doing pretty well. And then also the ratio of blast transition temperature to ambient temperature, if it is, less than 0.8, it is liquid like organic aerosol. If it's one or greater than one, it is solid. So the, the bottom most panel, the C panel, you are seeing that near the surface zero to two kilometer, you get liquid organic aerosol and the upper troposphere, you get solid. So to further understand what is, you know, so in this case, the, um, the bars I'm showing here, the gray bars, those are actual observations from the HALO aircraft at three different altitudes. And then I'm showing two sensi sens uh, sensitivity studies. The green bar has atmospheric chemistry in there for IPOX SOA, but then it also has a source of direct emissions of methyl tetras. 
And you see, especially if you focus on the upper troposphere, like 10 to 12 or 12 to 14 kilometer, it comes pretty close to the observations. And then there was another sensitivity which I did where you can, you can still have deep convection on in the model, but you turn off the convective transport of tracers due to deep convection, and that is the red. So if you turn off the deep convective transport of tracers, then you will not get the IPOX SOA which you are seeing in the upper troposphere. Um, and that is another um, um, proof that you know the, deep, with the you have you need in addition to atmospheric chemistry direct emissions you also need this deep convection events which actually are really important to explaining what is happening in the upper troposphere and and then also like if you look at the pie charts we see that near the surface the organic aerosol composition is more diverse than the upper troposphere so near the surface you have biomass burning you have uh, in addition to IPOX SOA, you have other isoprene SOA, you have monoterpene SOA. But if you look in the upper troposphere, about 70% is monoterpene SOA, and you still have 10% IPOX SOA. So it's less diverse in the upper troposphere, much more diverse near the surface. So that's why, because of the diversity of organic aerosol and because of other uncertainties, uh, what was what really jumped out was looking at the upper troposphere gave critical clues about how well you can constrain or understand the processes of IPOX SOA formation. So this is one example. This is from our previous study where we are, um, you know, Benzao was leading it and we were showing that uh, in both can be implemented the two-dimensional volatility basis set for monoterpenes. So that accounts for harm formation and their, um, their temperature dependent auto oxidation and their dependence on NOx. So if you, if you look at the, um, um, the total number concentrations of particles, they peak strongly in the upper troposphere. And, and with the right nucleation mechanisms and home formation, you can reproduce that high particle number concentration. So I'm showing this figure because in the upper troposphere, the model was predicting that about 70% was monoterpene. So that is not realistic based on, I mean, that is realistic based on measurements of um, total particle number concentrations, which we have seen before. So this is just a recap of several model sensitivity studies because we were proposing, we were thinking about a new mechanism which the atmospheric chemistry community has not considered so far, like with the direct emissions of methyl tetras. So we really had to make it rock solid. So I have done several different sensitivity studies in WorfChem. Uh, so one of them is what if we treat the particles as liquid-like in the upper troposphere so that they still can retain particle water and then the organic shell is still liquid-like. So can that explain IPOX SOA, right? And then there are there are other things where you emit the tetras, where you turn off the deep convective transport and then the, the another sensitivity was what if I just increase the reactive uptake coefficient or the chemical kinetics in the inorganic core? So how do these, how do these each of these sensitivity studies uh, affect IPOX SOA concentrations? So this is just, you know, the just showing a recap of the sensitivity studies you have uh, the observed as the gray bar and the blue is the default model. As you can see, if you focus on the upper troposphere, the model is order at least an order of magnitude lower than observations. And so now if you make, now what you do is if you treat the organic aerosol as liquid like in the upper troposphere, artificially by setting its diffusion coefficient to be equal to water, and then, then you also allow the particles to, def, uh, you know, to not to maintain to re retain liquid water in the particle phase. That is the yellow yellow line. So then you can explain measurements in the upper troposphere, right? So this is showing that these two mechanisms, where the primary diffusion limitations and um, existence of water in the particles, that was really the contributing factor um, to create model measurement differences. And this one, the magenta line now is, you still treat the particle as, um, you know, diffusion limited. Um, there is not much particle water, but you increase the reactive uptake coefficient in the aqueous inorganic core. So you can increase it near the surface, right? As you can see in the magenta line, but in the upper troposphere, you again have at least an order of magnitude difference. So just by increasing the reactive uptake coefficient, you increase what forms near the surface, but you cannot increase in the upper troposphere because of strong diffusion limitations and also because of absence of particle liquid water. 
and the green line is once we emit the methyl tetras directly from the forest, like we are emitting isoprene. And so then the green line now, the green line has all the realistic processes. It has um, diffusion limitations in organic shell. It also has um, almost zero liquid water content, like you would expect at low relative humidity. But the direct emissions of methyl tetras, as I explained, when they are transported by deep convection, they can condense directly and make these particles. So that comes pretty close to measurements. And then the red line is when you still have emissions of methyl tetras, but then you just turn the transport of tracers by you because the deep convection is transporting all the tracers to the upper troposphere. So in the model, you could still have deep convection on, but you could turn off the convective transport of tracers. And once you do that in the red line, you see that again in the upper troposphere, you cannot explain IPOS SOA. So that is really saying that all these processes, diffusion limitations in the organic shell, realistically treating relative humidity and particle liquid water, constraining the IPOX reactive uptake as much as you can, and then deep convection along with methyl tetral emissions, all these processes you needed to think about, and isoprene emissions, of course, to try to get the right answers and for the right reasons in the models. Very few models, you know, um, do such because this this took us more than a couple of years working through all these processes and and uh, this is i'm just showing you the surface distributions now of um, um, ipox soa so the leftmost panels are the default model where you don't add any emissions of methyl tetras and you could see like at zero to like if you look at the bottom panel the leftmost bottom panel you see at 0 to 0.5 um, near the surface, you see most IPOX is following the plumes. You have the plumes from Manaus going in. So because that's where in the plumes you have more sulfate and liquid water. So you will make more IPOX SOA over the plumes. But the reality was when the aircraft is measuring IPOX SOA, it's flying all over near the surface and upper troposphere. And everywhere it flies, it sees uni almost uniform concentrations of IPOX SOA or higher. So, so that is another evidence that once you put in the methyl tetral emissions in the mid middle panel, you see almost, you know, almost ubiquitous sources of IPOX SOA, both near the surface and upper troposphere. Especially for the upper troposphere, the contrast is huge, right? At 13 kilometer altitude, the default model has in the top panel, it has almost no IPOX SOA. Whereas when you have emissions of methyl tetras, you make more IPOX SOA. And when you turn off convective transport, it again goes down to zero. So this is just another figure here, which is showing you that, you know, you have these direct emissions of methyl tetras being carried up by cloud updrafts. And in the upper troposphere, there is no diffusion, no cloud chemistry, no uh, liquid water in the particle phase, but then the direct condensation of methyl tetras can explain um, um, it can uniquely explain aircraft measurements because we have looked through it by conducting many, many sensitivity studies in the model. This is just an ongoing work which I'm doing. So as I mentioned, we had to increase the reactive uptake coefficient of IPOX SOA. But, but in reality, what we are finding is that at high RH, at 50% RH, even the, the reactive uptake coefficient should be 10 times lower, not 10 times higher. So this is a work in preparation, again, trying to explain single particle measurements at MCEL because at high RH, we see that the base case model is greatly over predicting IPOX SOA. So that is again arguing that you don't need to, I mean, the measurements are saying you don't have to go higher. In fact, you have to go lower. So you will see even more gaps between model and measurements if you don't include these direct sources of method tetras. So this is my final slide. Um, just want to say like, what I learned from this is that the, comparing the measurements and model predictions at several levels, like both laboratories and field experiments is critical. They provide critical insights. And in this case, the upper troposphere, even though it was a big conundrum um, for me for at least a year or more, that really had critical clues about what is happening about IPOX SOA processes, which are not included in mock models. So at high altitudes, low relative humidity and temperature, lack of particle and cloud liquid water. And if the coating is solid, there is no way IPOX SOA can form in situ. So the direct emissions of methyl tetral gases from plants, which is related to environmental stressors, uh, plant stressors, you know, and their convective transport 
um, and condensation was critical. So this biological source of two methyl tetras, it's not well understood. So more measurements are needed um, to understand it, to measure it. Uh, but connecting in this case, like connecting the dots between different kinds of measurements, right? Like when I could not explain it in the upper troposphere, trying to connect the dots with other measurements, which were suggesting the possibility of methyl tetral emissions in gases. And then, um, and then thinking about how that changes IPOX SOA formation that showed the critical role of land atmosphere cloud interaction processes, uh, which are not included in models. And this, this has huge implications because I, methyl tetras are just one semi-volatile gas component. There are many other semi-volatile gases. And so when, when we are rapidly deforesting places like the Amazon, we are perturbing the natural processes of fine particle formation. Um, um, and these modulate both global warming effects, clouds and precipitation. So if you don't even have these processes in the models, we cannot predict their impacts. And so this is, this is why the connection between atmospheric chemistry, um, convective transport and the processes which, can, which we can constrain and measure is really important. Thank you. Questions for Manish? Really nice seminar, really nice work. So a question, the way I understand it, you're, you're using a core shell model where you've got the inorganic aqueous core and the organic plate on the outside. Um, would it make any difference to your model if instead of having a core shell model, you had phase separation where you had organic here and, and the liquid here? Yeah, yeah, that is a very nice question. It, it will matter. Um, but I think when we think about the upper troposphere, when the temperatures are that low, um, right, and, and if basically, and the relative humidity is low, like less than 30% or so, then in that case, not much water is there in the particle phase. Uh, and also, if it is not, if it is not a complete shell, right, like maybe I think like if there are, if it's not completely covered by SOI, right, there are pockets where it is not, uh, and then there is, um, there is liquid liquid phase separation. Yeah, that gets more complicated near the surface, I would say, but in the upper troposphere, again, like if even the clouds are ice clouds, right? So in that case, I think we, we have more confidence that, uh, you know, these processes of diffusion limitations and, uh, and absence of liquid water in particles is really governing. So thank you for your question. Yeah, Sanjay. Yeah, oh, very nice. So why do you think this is a biological source of uh, tetrals? Why cannot we just, uh, I, you know, you have horizontal air transport, isoprene oxidizing products sticking temporarily to increase the temperature, increasing the, the get off, they just see. They, they still form in the atmosphere, they just see them increase your this temporarily. Yeah, so Manish, can you repeat the question of the online audience? Yeah. Uh, so Sanjay's question is that why is it not a biological, why is it a biological source? Why cannot just be isoprene oxidation creating these products, right? Um, in the atmosphere? Yeah, so just to, and but the product, you know, the products, let's say first generation products, uh Sending volatiles that they, they can hold on to the surfaces of the trees a little bit. Yeah, that's that's a good. Um, I think so. Main thing about methyl tetrals is that it has to be uh, the particle phase is somehow involved because it has to have uh, um, water and acidity and other things. It's a acid catalyzed ring opening mechanism which forms. So right now we don't know of any direct gas phase chemistry mechanism which makes methyl tetras. Uh, that is one thing. So you need a heterogeneous medium, whether it is leaves or it could be soils. You know the the another possibility which we proposed in the paper is uh, that if there is gas phase IPOX which is deposited on the surface of soils or leaves, and if there is a medium there which has sulfate and inorganics and acidity, that can release methyl tetras. So. So yeah, that is a possibility and that has to be explored more through measurements. But direct gas phase chemistry making two methyl tetras, we don't know about that mechanism. Yeah, Sanjay. Yeah, so the 
Mm -hmm. so, uh, I, I may have missed but this Octavini paper of this IMS SOA pH change. So you said that uh, a full on sulfate formation pH will increase? Yeah, because, because it's we start with the seed of ammonium bisulfate. So it's a pure seed which is highly acidic at 5% relative humidity. So with the mosaic model or any other inorganic model, you get highly acidic seeds, like negative 3.5 or something. And then once you start making IPOX SOA, uh, the sulfate, the inorganic sulfate that acts as a nucleophile, so that can, that makes organosulfates. And so when you are removing the inorganic sulfate, so uh, you want to buy sulfate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inorganic bi so you are removing from the bisulfate, yes. But then you are decreasing the acidity, right? So you are making more than whatever ammonium is there. I think it will increase the sulfate. It will go to ammonium sulfate over time. So that process, if you if models don't include that process, then they will maintain very high acidity and make too much hypox SOA. Is that measure by experiments? The acidity itself was not measured by acidity is a calculation, but I think uh, there were other things which were measured like uh, the site distribution change, um, the, the mass spectra measurements from SPLAT, and then also the changes in density and volatility of particles. I think Michael has a question. On an earlier pause, you wanted to point out how important isoprene was for your aerosols. But it seems as though even in the middle of the tropical rainforest, ice cream is only 30% of the mass. What's the rest of it? So you mean of the um, of the VOC mass? Or, um, well, I don't know. You, just, you attribute the negative breakdown of the oh, That was just uh, only 30%, 30%. Yeah. So two -third, more than two thirds is coming from what? Is it in our hand? Is it just other VOCs? So this is just the breakdown of organic aerosols? Right in the pie chart. So, uh, yes, so near the surface, you have 20% IPOX SOA. In the upper troposphere, you have 10% from the model. But there are other isoprene SOA, uh, which is not going through the IPOX pathway. Right. So, that, that's just gas phase chemistry. Isoprene reacting in the gas phase with OH, ozone, and nitrate radicals and forming SOA. But that does not need the aqueous phase chemistry pathway. And then you have monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes. Uh, that is lumped into the terpene SOA category. And near the surface, you also have biomass burning PO primary and secondary organic aerosol. But in the upper troposphere at 12 to 14 kilometers, we see much less biomass burning contribution. Okay, don't see anything uh, online. Um, thank you, everyone. Let's uh, thank Manish one more time. Thank you.